connection. All right. That's going to bring us up to number seven. And, like, and I'm counting up to the best, okay? From, from not too good to the better. Number seven. This is dealing with heat pumps in particular. Heat pumps, it is very hard to charge up a heat pump or check the charge on a heat pump in the heating mode. The ideal situation is to check it in the cooling mode. Well, what has a problem with that? If it's in the heating season, things aren't going to look right unless the loads are correct to be able to check the charge. So a quick way and a very good tool is to look at the discharge temperature. <coughs> that is the, well I cannot spell, I need a lesson in spelling. Uh, discharge temperature, we take a reading of the discharge line a few inches away from the compressor. Well, this temperature should be approximately 100 degrees warmer than where the, the ambient is. Okay, if it's 30 degrees outside, what's that tell me my discharge line should be? 130. 130. Okay, give or take a few degrees, okay? If it's 60 degrees outside, I would expect to see a discharge temperature around 160. Is that a way to charge the system? It'll get you by, but it's not the best way by any means. Okay? A few years ago this was put out as a bulletin and for some reason or another people didn't read the second page. They read the first chip page and it talked about charging, looking at the discharge temperature. That's fine and dandy, but if you looked over at the second page of the memo, if you will, it showed that this was only a test and it was a way to do a quick analysis. Nobody read the second page and all of a sudden Everybody was charging the discharge temperatures alone. Okay, so goes back to more than one test to figure out what's going on. Okay, brings us to number six. Now we're getting into a lot better ways here. Pressures is what we're going to be dealing with. High and low side. This works real well when I have a TXV or a TEV as some people call them nowadays, thermostatic expansion valve. We can get in the ballpark by taking the ambient temperature, that is the outside temperature or the temperature around the outside coil, add somewhere between 20 and 30 degrees to that temperature. In other words, if it's 90 degrees outside, I would add it up to where it'd be 110 or 120, somewhere along in there. Looking at my temperature pressure chart as we did a while ago, I need to know what type of refrigerant I got. And at that point, when I looked on there for 110 de degrees, it would give me the approximate head pressure reading that I would expect to see. Okay, the higher the efficiency of the system, the less amount of temperature that I need to add to the ambient. That make any sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. What about the suction pressure? What should it be? Well, what's air conditioning generally going to have a evaporator coil to operate at? What temperature? Forty. Forty. The higher efficiency may work at forty-five. What's that relate to it as a pressure for a particular refrigerant? Let's use R22, for example. Right at second. Right, 68, 70 pounds of pressure. Okay, one problem here. That's an ideal situation. That's with all the air flows where they need to be. Everything clean. All, if you will, the vents open. Okay. No dog hair in the condensing unit. Don't ever see that, do you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, love my grandkids, but let me tell you, if there's anything in the yard when it comes, I shouldn't say anything because he cuts grass. I got one that loves to cut grass. But it doesn't matter where, 
if it's anything later than the R or where the where the clippings go. If the unit's right there, mm -hmm. of course he's in high gear, it doesn't take long to get by there. You know, but the thing about it is people don't think about that when they when they're doing yard care. How many times have I seen a fence put around a condensing unit, uh, some kind of decorative fence, but it, it, it hurts the airflow? So there's not an ideal world out there. I kind of got off on a little bit of a tangent, but I got what I'm trying to emphasize is pressures alone won't do the job. Okay? There's a lot of factors. D, were you still good on time? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Um, which brings us up to another one. If I can't depend on pressures alone, in refrigeration, we have something that's known as a sight glass. Now, sight glasses, there's nothing in the world but a place in the line that you can see inside that line. Okay? Now, on our liquid line, what should the refrigerant, what state should the refrigerant be in? Liquid? liquid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if it's operating correctly, that's what we would want to see. Now, you don't see that many sight glasses being used on air conditioning. But in the refrigeration world, this is a biggie. Does that mean that if I see bubbles, and please don't call it air, bubbles in the sight glass, that it's low? The answer is no. If I have a low ambient condition and I have a fan cycle system uh, uh, controlling my ambient or my head pressure, every time that fan cycles, that sight glass is going to bubble. Because I lower my temperature. If I have liquid that is above the saturation point, it's going to boil off until it becomes below the saturation point. Saturation point meaning the boiling point. So if I continue to charge a system up until I see no bubbles at all in the sight glass, I would grossly overcharge that system. Okay? It's a tool. It's no different than using your electrical meter or a screwdriver or anything else or the hammer. You know, we take a hammer and use it for everything. No, let's see. That's the crescent wrench in there. Okay. You know, it's a hammer. Remember those advertisements? One tool for everything? Alabama socket set. There you go. There you go. I seen a picture the other day of a, of a, uh, standard socket set and then the wrench was turned over adjustable wrench and that was the metric version <laughs> <laughs> all right I know this is depressing because so far I haven't given you a good way to charge have I? I've given you some examples of, of tests but I haven't given you a real good example of what's the best well, let's get down to what most manufacturers are using nowadays for their uh, charging procedures. And especially with the 410A, I'm going to erase these. Okay. Um, do you think we need to leave these up for, for reference? Or? Okay. All right. We'll go ahead and erase these. And we're going to start off with number four on our list of things to do. Hey, let's, let's take a break right there. It'll be a good time to 